Presidential pick, Donald Trump's campaign manager Kellyanne Conway is headed to the White House. Manhunt in Europe, more clues in Germany's search for a Tunisian man suspected in an attack on a Berlin market. Christmas greeting, Pope Francis meets with Vatican leadership and employees. We'll talk to Edward Penton in Rome about the Holy Father's forceful message. And a different kind of preaching. These Dominican friars are spreading the Christmas message through song. On EWTN News Nightly for Thursday, December 22nd, 2016. Good evening from Washington and thanks for joining us around the world. I'm Jason Calvi in for Lauren Ashburn. President-elect Donald Trump names Kellyanne Conway as his White House counselor. Conway is a Catholic known for her work in the pro-life movement. She led Trump to victory as his campaign manager, and she'll be the highest ranking woman in the West Wing. Kellyanne Conway, the first woman to successfully run a presidential campaign, is one of Trump's most visible advisors. Today she appeared on television, as she often does. I'm just really pleased and frankly very humbled to take on this role in the West Wing near the president and to be supportive of the senior team that he already has in place. The longtime Republican pollster and conservative strategist isn't afraid to stand up to her boss. She wasn't quiet about opposing the prospect of Mitt Romney as Secretary of State. And that outspoken nature will be key when it comes to defending life, according to leaders in the movement. She's part of the pro-life movement, and he knows that. And to a point is his really closest advisor in the White House, a person with that pro-life background, those credentials and that knowledge, says something about Mr. Trump. Conway has a strong rapport with the president-elect who called her a tireless and tenacious advocate with amazing insights. She often talks about being a wife and a mother to four young children who will now leave New York City, relocating to Washington. Joining us now is Al Weaver, who has been covering the transition for the Washington Examiner. Kellyanne Conway is known as the Trump whisperer for really turning the Trump candidacy around and leading to the win. What do you think her role will be in the White House? Well, she's going to be a big, you know, major advisor for the camp, or for, not for the campaign, for the White House administration now. Uh, I mean, one of, the, one of the main priorities she's big is, is messaging. She's really good with messaging. Uh, as you can see with the campaign, you know, she really helped turn the tide of her and Steve Bannon. Uh, once they came on board, Trump is really starting to stay on message. Uh, uh, starting to stick to his talking points. I think that's going to be a big thing, and she's also going to help with uh, legislative uh, you know, issues, whatever they may be, you know, coming in the next year. Mm. And one of the things that she is known for with her with her past is being a pro-life advocate. Mm -hmm. She's worked with a lot of pro-life candidates as well. Do you think that she's going to have uh, influence on on the president, uh, President Trump, and his pro-life uh, mm -hmm. promises moving forward? I'd be surprised if she didn't. I mean, she's one of the more powerful women, especially who's going to be in the administration. She holds a lot of uh, gravitas within uh, the camp. With, without the uh, the Trump camp, uh, you know, she's really well thought of, and, and she has a, ha a history of you know, backing pro-life candidates. You know, she worked for Mike Pence before she came on with Trump, and was a senior advisor and ultimately a campaign manager. And before that, she was Ted, one of Ted Cruz's. Uh, she headed up a Ted Cruz Super PAC, who obviously is one of the more pro-life people in the party. So she's a long track record, track record of this, and I think, you know, especially for those who are concerned that Trump may not be the most steadfast on you know, pro-life issues, she's really going to help. In, in having that history with with Pence. And, and with Cruz could be a, a, a thorn in yeah. the side of, uh, of the, the president-elect. Do you think that will help heal that relationship a little more? I, I think so. I mean, Ted Cruz, he, 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 I'd be surprised if he's going to come out and say, you know, I'm not going I'm, I'm to buck you on this unless it's really something big that he's not alone in doing. I don't think he's going to be a sole person in blocking things uh, because he doesn't want to anger his base. He's got a re-election in 2018 that he's not going to want to fire up any activists against him. We're running out of time, but really quick, what do you think the, the cabinet picks so far reveal about the Trump's uh, next four years as president? Well, I think the one thing, the, the one theme you keep seeing is this kind of the, you know, apprenticification of, mm -hmm. uh, of, the, of the process. I mean, you saw what he did with Secretary of State. Uh, you know, he brought Mitt Romney in two or three times, you know, for dinner in front of cameras and paraded all of everyone through Trump Tower and Mar-a-Lago. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's one of the real interesting things you're going to see in the next four years is, is him really trying to play a lot of things out in public. And we'll be watching you and you're reporting at the Washington Examiner. Thank you so much, Al Weaver. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me. And the president-elect picks another Catholic for a top communications post. 
Sean Spicer, a current Trump transition spokesman, will be White House press secretary. Spicer was the communications director for the Republican National Committee. He's an ally of incoming White House Chief of Staff, Reince Priebus. Two Americans are among the injured in the attack on a Berlin Christmas market. The State Department hasn't released any more information. This comes as police in Europe scramble to find the Tunisian man suspected of driving a truck into the packed market, killing 12. Germany's interior minister says they found his fingerprints in the truck. A House panel says some Planned Parenthood clinics, a late-term abortionist, and other businesses may have broken the law. The House Select Panel on Infant Lives announces 15 referrals it's made, including four Planned Parenthood clinics that may have broken the law. The panel says evidence also suggests middlemen linking abortion clinics and researchers may have profited on the sale of fetal tissue, which is against the law. The panel also is referring to prosecutors a late-term abortionist who may have killed babies partially out of the womb. North Carolina's transgender bathroom bill stays in place. This follows an aggressive campaign to repeal the law. Mark Irons joins us now with that story. Mark? Jason, House Bill 2, known as the bathroom bill, says a person must use the bathroom that corresponds to the gender on their birth certificate. The law was passed in North Carolina in response to the ordinance in the city of Charlotte that allowed transgender people to use the bathroom of their choice. A deal to remove the Charlotte ordinance in exchange for throwing out the bathroom bill fell apart last night. Opponents of North Carolina's bathroom bill protest after the law remains intact. We came here with the promise that we were going to be considering a full, clean repeal. Uh, instead, uh, Senate leadership has brought us a bill on which they've reneged on that promise. It's a win for social conservatives and the pro-family group NC Values Coalition. Executive Director Tammy Fitzgerald encouraging leaders to never sacrifice the privacy, safety, or freedom of young girls by forcing them to use the bathroom, shower, or change clothes with grown men. Republican lawmakers in the state say the city of Charlotte never officially lifted its ordinance for transgender people. Democrat governor-elect Roy Cooper blames Republicans. I am disappointed that Republican legislative leaders failed to live up to their promise. Republican supporters of HB2 insist that a full, clean repeal was never promised. We never said to voters that actually we're going to come in in December and see if we can repeal this. North Carolina Republicans did offer a repeal to the bathroom bill, which would actually temporarily ban local governments from enacting laws like Charlotte's transgender ordinance. Democrats want nothing to do with that, and that repeal failed to get enough votes last night, Jason. Thanks, Mark Iron. Thank you. Other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Syria's armed forces say Aleppo is back in the government's control. This ends a four-year rebel hold over parts of the city. It comes as the evacuations of the last remaining civilians and fighters wrap up. The recapture of Aleppo is a major turning point in the Syrian civil war. It's also a victory for President Bashar al-Assad and a crushing defeat for Syria's opposition. The ancient city has been divided into rebel and government parts since 2012. Russia's ambassador to Turkey is laid to rest in Moscow. Andrei Karloff has, was gunned down by a Turkish policeman Monday. Turkey blames an exiled cleric living in the United States as the mastermind behind the assassination. But Russia is pushing back against that allegation, saying they're still investigating. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and President-elect Donald Trump urged the United States to veto a United Nations resolution. It would demand Israeli settlement activities in the West Bank stop. The vote was supposed to take place today, but is now postponed. Pope Francis names a commission to investigate a scandal involving the former Grand Chancellor of the Order of Malta. He was ousted earlier this month. It's reported he didn't prevent the group's workers in Africa from passing out condoms. Now a church lawyer, Vatican diplomat, and members of the order will look into the matter. And Pope Francis blasts resistance to reforms he's trying to make in the Vatican. Cari fratelli, non sono le rughe che nella chiesa si devono temere, ma le macchie. The Holy Father addressing members of the Vatican Curia during his annual Christmas greeting today. 
The Curia is the administration that governs the church. Francis also met with Vatican employees. Ed Penton, Rome correspondent for EWTN's National Catholic Register, joins us now. This is the third year in a row that Francis has taken the Vatican bureaucracy to task. What was his message today? Well, Jason, it was really uh, uh, to reiterate his uh, wish that the Curia be renewed, and especially the personnel be renewed. He talks about a conversion of the Curia, and he talks about a change of mentality as well. Um, but he was also very forceful today, as he was two years ago, when he talked about the diseases of the Curia. Now he's giving uh, guidelines on how to, to fulfill that reform, and he talks about an unconditioned obedience uh, to the Pope's vision for reform, which is a very strong term used, but one uh, which he obviously feels is needed in order to overcome the resistance that's there. And the resistance to, to the reforms just of the Vatican bureaucracy, is that what he's referring to here? Yes, he is. Yes, he's talking about uh, resistance in, in various forms. He talks about uh, there's a good resistance, which is willing to dialogue. He talks about the resistance, which is about the, wanting to preserve the status quo. And then he talks about a malevolent dialogue, which he says is uh, really not wanting any change um, and is putting up obstructions in the way of that reform. So what are these sort of guiding principles that he's laying out for the Vatican government? Well, it's a mix, really. Again, he wants, uh, he talks about conversion. He talks about the need for the curia to be missionary in nature. He talks about a, a clear direction, um, a clear organization, rather. But he also talks about synodality, which is interesting, because synodality in the curia, as elsewhere, means a kind of democratizing of the church. It means decentralizing it, taking it away from the authority of the dicastery heads, the heads of the departments, and putting it in the hands of bishops and the pope himself. Ed Penton, you've written a lot about this. We can read all of your work on uh, EWTN's National Catholic Register online as well. We'll check you out there. Thanks, Edward. Thanks, Jason. Coming up, living inside a communist country, a pro-life and human rights activist shares his Cuban story. And crisis in South Sudan, what the Catholic Church is doing there and how you can help. O King of all nations and keystone of the church, come and save man whom you formed from the dust. That's today's O Antiphon. It's a short verse used during evening prayer in the days leading up to Christmas. What a year for Cuba. The death of Fidel Castro in November, President Obama visiting, and the first commercial U.S. to Havana flight in more than 50 years. The country mourned Castro's death for nine days before a small, private funeral took place lasting just three minutes. The dictator ruled the communist country for decades. And our Susie Pinto sat down with a political prisoner in Havana who won the U.S. Presidential Medal of Freedom back in 2008, and he's still fighting today for democracy in Cuba. Dr. Oscar Bisset knows Cuba's struggles well. The pro-life and human rights activist has been fighting Cuba's communist regime for more than 30 years. The devout Christian says there's no religious freedom in Cuba. And those who express dissent are harassed by the government. After more than 50 years of dictatorship, Bissett is calling for free elections in Cuba. He compares Raul Castro to Hitler or Stalin. And the doctor says while Castro is in power, there will be no freedom. But after decades of conflict with the government, including jail and torture, Bissett has not lost sight of his goal. His dream, a free Cuba. Susie Pinto, EWTN News Nightly. And what a dream. Thank you so much, Susie, for that report. Well, more than one million people have fled South Sudan. It's a country rocked by civil war. Five years after gaining its independence, Lauren Ashburn speaks to the head of the Catholic bishops in Sudan and South Sudan. Bishop Eduardo, people are warning that this could become another Rwanda-like situation. Is this genocide? Mm, uh, no, the word genocide, I cannot be able to pronounce it because uh, it's such a complicated uh, uh, vocabulary. Uh, it describes a situation where uh, people target each other because of who they are. Uh, but I think uh, it is still too early to arrive to that aspect within 
South Sudan and Sudan. And I say so because uh, efforts have to be exhausted and then to make sure this stops. Mm -hmm. But the worry is if the war doesn't stop, we don't, if the war doesn't come to an end, then it is like a virus, it will continue to develop and could reach that possibility if it's not stopped now. You know, I know that all across the world about two billion dollars has been pumped into Sudan and South Sudan and I know that Sudan Relief Fund has raised about two million dollars to help in the area. How else are Catholics helping other than monetarily? Uh, Catholics uh, continue to help us through prayers, their solidarity and the closeness, being close to us. And th that's one of the big and uh, the biggest uh, support uh, Catholics do. And then some others do by sacrificing the, the support they have by giving some money like what they give to Sudan Relief Fund. And this money comes in and you have to provide food for orphans, displaced people, uh, refugees, and also provide learning space uh, for, for children and medicines uh, for people who have no uh, uh, medical support. What would you like Americans to know about South Sudan and why helping is so important? There are many crises around the world. Tell us about why this one is so important. No, I think it's so important to, uh, to call on people to help South Sudan because human beings are living in South Sudan and they are in difficulty and they, they are in the midst of civil war and uh, when the war happens everything is in disorder and so the support for the ordinary women and children and people who have left their homes uh, is so needed. How do you every day look at what's happening to your people and not lose faith? Uh, what helps me to support, be available is my faith in God because I know God is my Father, is my Creator. And He is providing more than anything for the good of the people in the area and myself as His servant to continue to, to enrich myself with these spiritual gifts to respond to the challenges that are there. You've seen dead bodies, you've seen this horror. Are you afraid to be killed? Are you afraid that will happen to you? No, people have already died ahead of me and I cannot be afraid because I know that the way we, we have to go, people have to die. So I've seen bodies, I've seen dead people and uh, I have cried with tears when I had seen that and I've complained that human life needs to be protected and human life needs to be enhanced because this is the child, this is the daughter of God. And so um, I will continue to speak on the importance of saving life and protecting life and urging everybody, the government and whoever is there, to make sure human life needs to be protected. And even when human life is dead, somebody is dead, deserves a decent barrier. Bishop Kusala, thank you so much for coming to the United States telling the story of the South Sudan people. It's a pleasure. I appreciate it. Thank you for hosting me. Yeah. And our thanks to Lauren Ashburn and His Excellency for that discussion, which we taped a little earlier. If you'd like to help, please visit SudanReliefFund.com. Up next, the birth of Jesus depicted in art. Jem Sullivan shows us the beauty of faith. And you can find them on iTunes. These Dominican friars are now producing music and spreading the Christmas message through song. I'm Lauren Ashburn, managing editor and anchor for EWTN News Nightly. From Father Patrick and our news team here in Washington, D.C., to all of you around the world. Merry Christmas! Ho, ho, ho. <laughs> <laughs>
to get us ready for Christmas, we're joined by Dr. Jem Sullivan, author of The Beauty of Faith. The first painting is The Expectant Madonna with St. Joseph, and in this painting we see the Virgin Mary fully pregnant, ready to give birth to our, our, to our Lord. That's right, Jason. It's not very often that we find images of the expectant Mary, uh, which makes this rare 15th century painting from the National Gallery of Art a special, because we see a very pregnant Mary surrounded by angels uh, and St. Joseph looking over her shoulders. It is as if we could hear both Mary and Joseph pray those words of Advent, come Lord Jesus, as they wait for the baby Jesus. Um, along the border of Mary's mantle uh, are the words, Alleluia, Queen of Heaven, rejoice. Um, and in her right hand, Mary holds the Word of God because she is the one who always ponders in her heart the Word of God who came to dwell in her. Well, it's something for us to reflect on these last few days of Advent before we get ready for the Christmas season. Now I want to look at the second painting, which is actually a depiction of Christmas. It is uh, Giorgione's The Adoration of the Shepherds. And looking at the shepherds, they're very poor in this painting. They've ripped up clothes and everything. They're the first to, to get there in the Gospel accounts, the first to get there to see Jesus. That's right, Jason. You know, Jesus was born in the most humble, poor, simple of human conditions. Uh, and this divine humility is shown to us so beautifully in this 16th century painting by Giorgione, uh, who was a master painter of Venice. Uh, the baby Jesus is lying on the ground. This is utter divine humility. Um, and he is protected only with his mother's cloak um, uh, from the elements. Uh, the holy child here is radiating divine light onto the entire scene. Um, and then the two shepherds, uh, together with Mary and Joseph, are kneeling in quiet adoration. And to me, this painting really is an invitation uh, for us to join our voices uh, with that Christmas hymn of praise, O come, let us adore him, Christ the Lord. And that's something we can teach our, our children and our grandchildren and our nieces and nephews, whatever we might have in our families. When we look at these paintings, it's a lesson for our children. What would you want to, what would you teach my children about this one in particular? You know, this one is really an invitation to just kneel before the baby Jesus and welcome him into not only our homes, into our church, into our hearts and into our minds uh, and into our families. So it's really an invitation to worship and adore the Lord. And that's something we will tweet out the pictures of these so you can follow along uh, and, and share this with your family. Dr. Jem Sullivan, author of Beauty of Faith, thank you so much for your time and Merry Christmas. The same to you, Jason. Thank you. And a group of friars is hitting all the right notes just in time for Christmas. 800 years after their order's founding, they're finding new ways to preach the good news. Mark Irons with our story again tonight. The Dominicans. A religious order of preachers founded 800 years ago, now available on iTunes. The album reached actually number 21 on the iTunes classical album chart. So that's pretty high for us. People might be interested in what we have going on. At the Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C., these friars have been perfecting and packaging their sound. It's a talented group of friars. This is the fourth album that they've produced. Their latest creation, a 16-track Christmas album. People love Christmas, and people love Christmas music. It took a lot of practice. At least 50 hours. Really? Singing. Recording and engineering. We basically run our own label here. We call it Dominicana Records. But a group of preachers in the record business? Brother Justin Bolger had his own record deal in Nashville before joining the Dominicans in 2012. He says the music produced here fits with the mission. The Dominican Order was founded to preach for the salvation of souls. So that's our main mission is to preach, whether that's in a conference or the classroom or most importantly at mass. But music is sort of an indirect way of preaching. You're offering something beautiful that hopefully draws the listener in. A new form of preaching for $9.99. All proceeds go to the formation of these student brothers trained to go out and preach the truth. The truth that this album conveys is that Christ was born to save. Mark Irons, EWTN News Nightly. Well, I could listen to that all day long. Thank you, Mark. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, to all of you around the world, I'm Jason Calvi. We'll be back again on Tuesday. We leave you tonight with a look at the festivities at the Vatican. We wish you a happy and holy Christmas. Good night and God bless.